What if I told you that following the diabetes plate method advocated by the American Diabetes Association is not the best way to reverse prediabetes or diabetes? My hope is that this episode brings crystal clarity about the best foods to eat to lower blood sugar and why. Foods that keep blood sugar low will also help keep blood insulin, which is your fat creation and storage hormone, low. If you're among the estimated 88% of adults with insulin resistance, these are also the best foods to help you lose weight with insulin resistance. Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Dr. Morgan Nolte, and as a geriatric physical therapist, I've seen the negative effects of high blood sugar and diabetes. I've also seen how our traditional medical model has failed to prevent and reverse insulin resistance. Insulin resistance increases the risk of multiple comorbidities, including obesity, diabetes, heart disease, dementia, and more. I'm thrilled that you're watching or listening to this episode to help you learn how to prevent or reverse prediabetes or type 2 diabetes by eating foods that will help lower your blood sugar naturally. This will help you avoid medications for blood sugar, or if you're already taking medications, improving your nutrition will help you reduce the amount you need, and in some cases, get off them completely. Of course, in collaboration with your physician. If you're watching on YouTube, please take a moment to subscribe to this channel, like this video, and share it with someone you know who could benefit from seeing it. If you're listening to the podcast version, please take a moment to leave a rating and review. That engagement helps this content get seen by and in turn help as many people as possible. And I want this to be a two-way conversation. I'll be sharing information and asking questions throughout this episode. And I'd love to see your side of the conversation in the comments on YouTube. So be sure to post your comments and questions throughout the video. A quick search of Dr. Google reveals why there is so much confusion about what to eat if you have prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. Poor nutrition advice is directly provided on the American Diabetes Association or ADA website. A recent search of their nutrition recommendations for diabetes reveals this diabetes plate method. In this episode, you'll learn why this is not the best advice for people with diabetes and prediabetes and how to eat instead. The key takeaways from the American Diabetes Association website are general, unhelpful, and frankly, don't make sense to someone who actually understands how the food you eat impacts your blood sugar. You'll be able to count yourself in that camp of understanding how food impacts blood sugar after listening to this entire episode. The American Diabetes Association is not all bad, but as a trusted healthcare organization, they have a responsibility to provide more evidence-based information to their audience. In my opinion, the worst part is that these big politicized organizations have a large influence over what's being taught in healthcare schools today. And if clinicians aren't actively seeking the truth, they can easily defer to these big organizations and be offering suboptimal and in some cases, harmful nutrition and lifestyle advice. Once you understand how different macronutrients impact your blood sugar and insulin, making healthy food choices to lower your blood sugar becomes simple. If you have a direct family member with diabetes, it's true that your risk is higher for the disease, but you are not destined for diabetes. Genetics do play a role, but lifestyle matters more. Another roadblock people encounter when learning how to eat to lower blood sugar is carbophobia. They become afraid to eat any carbs at all and end up on an unsustainably restrictive diet. Not all carbs are unhealthy, and you'll learn which ones to enjoy and which ones to limit in this episode. A big takeaway that I want you to understand is that if you have prediabetes or diabetes, you have insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is what is driving your high blood sugars and it's essential that if you truly want to impact your health for good, that you learn how to live a low insulin lifestyle. 
In fact, fasting insulin can predict type 2 diabetes up to two decades prior to fasting blood sugar. Now, if you're already working to eat a lower sugar diet, be sure to stay until the end because I will reveal several ingredients hiding in plain sight that are sugar-free but still raising your blood sugar levels. The sooner you get control of your blood sugar, the better. I truly believe that each of us is responsible for our own choices, and when we know better, we can do better. My mission as a geriatric physical therapist who has treated end-stage diabetes and seen the amputations, dementia, heart disease, and inflammation that rob not only your quality of life but the quality of life of your caregivers is to help you be proactive with your health so you never get to that point. Take it from me, disease is so much easier to prevent and reverse rather than kicking the can down the road and hoping things will get better. Only you can make things better. If you have a story about how you've changed your health for the better, tell us your story in the comments. It's so inspiring for others who may be just starting their journey to better health. I'm going to be giving you a ton of great information in this episode. If you need to watch it several times to soak it in, do it. We've also added timestamps to make it easy to scroll through. I recommend listening to the full episode the first time around, then going back to the points that you want to re-listen to afterwards. To avoid overwhelm, I always want to remind you to pick just one to three low-hanging fruits from this episode to optimize. I want you to think about this question as you watch or listen. What is the easiest thing that I can change that would make the biggest impact on my health? What is the easiest thing that I can change that would have the biggest impact on my health? Start there and get consistent. It could be a simple switch from white or whole wheat pasta to a pasta that ma that's made from edamame or chickpeas. Simple and quick. That's how healthy habits are made. Progress over perfection, my friend. Here are the main topics I'm covering in this episode. We'll start with a discussion about prediabetes and diabetes, including symptoms and specific glucose and hemoglobin A1C cutoffs. It's so important that you know your numbers. It's one thing to get tested and see the numbers. However, I encourage you to actually understand your numbers and figure out if you are in the healthy, prediabetes, or diabetes range. Then retest as often as your doctor recommends, or at least every six to 12 months to check your progress. If you've been putting off getting your blood sugar tested, don't. It can be eye-opening and empowering to see the changes on the inside, even if your weight loss is slow on the outside. After this discussion on symptoms and testing, we are doing a crash course in macronutrients. You'll learn how different carbohydrates, proteins, and fats impact your blood sugar levels. I covered protein a lot last month in this video, so the focus here will be on healthy carbohydrates and fats along with my top protein picks to help lower blood sugar. After covering the macronutrients, I'll share a few powerhouse micronutrients or vitamins and minerals that help balance your blood sugar. Next, you'll learn about a few sugar-free food additives that I recommend avoiding to keep your blood sugars down. Just because a food is sugar-free doesn't mean it won't raise blood sugar. And be sure to stay till the end because I'm going to give you two hot tips to control your blood sugar after a high carb meal. You do not want to miss out on those. As always, if you find this helpful and want a comprehensive streamlined system to lower your blood sugar and insulin, be sure to check out my online course and coaching program, Zivly. Inside, you'll learn all the pillars of a low insulin lifestyle in depth, including what to eat, when to eat, exercise or movement, stress management, sleep, and environment or toxins. All of these are on a strong foundation of mindset. This video covers just some of what I teach under the fuel pillar in the program. To learn more about my online weight loss course and coaching program, go to zivly.com. That's www.zivly.com. You can either join directly from there or book an absolutely free discovery call to get your program-related questions answered 
and be sure it's the best fit for you before joining. If you've been on the fence about joining or simply want to see what's on the inside, book your free discovery call today. That's zivly.com. All right, let's dive into today's episode. Prediabetes is when your blood sugar is elevated, but not high enough to be considered in the diabetes range. Here's a chart that shows normal prediabetes and diabetes cutoffs for blood glucose and A1C. A normal fasting blood glucose is 70 to 99 or a hemoglobin A1C of 5.6 or less. Prediabetes is when your fasting blood glucose is 100 to 125 or an A1C of 5.7 to 6.4. Type 2 diabetes is when your fasting blood glucose is 126 or higher on two separate tests or an A1C of 6.5 or greater. First, let's talk about what prediabetes actually is and different tests for prediabetes. Once we discuss the tests, I'll also share some symptoms of prediabetes too. Let me share an email I received recently from someone that highlights the importance of this episode and why it's critical that you take responsibility for your health and that you know your numbers. I removed some details from the email to make it more anonymous. This person wrote, I have been tracking my food intake, but not my blood glucose levels because my doctor said that since my A1C was under seven, that I didn't need to worry about it. During the last three to four months, I decided I wanted to check my daily fasting glucose level in the morning. I discovered that I was getting numbers from 140 to 165 and occasionally up to 190. At my recent checkup, my A1C was 5.9. Can you explain my dilemma and what I should do now? In a nutshell, she lost a little bit of weight tracking calories, but she wasn't sure what the next step to take was to really optimize her blood sugars and continue her weight loss. This episode will answer that question. I want to highlight that this person's doctor said not to worry about her A1C until it was seven. As you just learned, that's half a point above the diabetic cutoff. Her doctor said not to worry about her blood sugar until she was already diabetic. My guess is because that's the point when the doctor would actually do something in the form of prescribing a medication. But there are so many changes that can be made proactively to prevent the need for medication altogether. Our medical system just isn't set up well to prevent disease. When you only have five to 10 minutes with your doctor, They don't have the time to sit down and explain to you what it actually takes to lower blood sugar. They do have time to write a prescription. And I know this time crunch frustrates doctors too, because most get into the profession to help people. So if you have high blood sugar, I highly recommend you consider joining my online program Zibli, because it's going to give you the information your doctor either doesn't know or doesn't have time to share with you to lower your blood sugar, like the doctor of the person who sent me that email. Another test that's a little more involved than the fasting blood sugar or A1C test is the oral glucose tolerance test or OGTT. Glucose tolerance refers to how well your body processes glucose or sugar after being given a measured dose, usually 75 grams orally. 75 grams of glucose is the equivalent amount of sugar that would be in almost two cups of pasta or one and three quarters of a cup of white rice. Normally what happens when you have a bolus of glucose like this is your blood sugar goes up and then comes back down over the next several hours. But if you have prediabetes or type two diabetes, your blood sugar takes longer to come back down. Here are the cutoffs for the oral glucose tolerance test two hours after consuming 75 grams of glucose. A blood glucose under 140 milligrams per deciliter is considered normal. A blood glucose of 140 to 199 milligrams per deciliter indicates you may have prediabetes, sometimes referred to as impaired fasting glucose. A blood glucose of greater or equal to 200 milligrams per deciliter indicates you may have diabetes. The oral glucose tolerance test is actually where my obsession with nutrition started. 
I feel my OGTT when I was pregnant with my son Dawson. I got a 141 and I was so mad. I felt like I should know better. I took that failed test seriously and started to learn as much as I could about nutrition and insulin resistance. And that's what I get to share with you now. As I mentioned, fasting insulin can predict type two diabetes up to two decades before fasting glucose. Insulin is the hormone that helps allow blood glucose to move from your blood into your cells. Your pancreas can only produce so much insulin. Over time, the amount of insulin required to keep your blood sugars normal goes up and up. With the rising level of insulin in your blood, your cells become resistant to its effect. So this upward regulation where your blood sugars go up after a meal, that normal amount of insulin is released, but your cells are less sensitive to insulin's effect because of the insulin resistance. So more insulin is secreted to keep blood sugars in the normal range. But over time, you become more and more resistant and your pancreas reaches its capacity at how much insulin it can produce. Insulin can no longer keep blood sugar down. So that's when we start to see prediabetes. Dr. Pradnip Jamadas talks about the Kraft test. This is a combination test that measures both glucose and insulin response following a meal. The Kraft test can catch prediabetes even before your blood glucose level because it also tests the insulin in the background that's actually responsible for controlling your blood glucose. High insulin levels are associated with all the same conditions as type two diabetes, things like cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, dementia, inflammation, blindness, and peripheral neuropathy. So let me explain how the Kraft test is a step up from the oral glucose tolerance test and will catch prediabetes by looking at a person's insulin response instead of just their fasting glucose response. For the Kraft test, you drink 75 grams of glucose. Then your glucose and insulin are measured at the half hour, one, two, and three hour marks to make the curves and see the relationships between a person's glucose and insulin response. A prediabetic could still have a relatively normal blood glucose response. In people with a healthy insulin response, you should see the insulin curve following the blood glucose curve. But in someone who has prediabetes, the insulin curve will be higher because more insulin is needed. This is because the cells are less sensitive to insulin's effect. Their body is a little insulin resistant, but their insulin can still keep up and that brings the blood sugar level down but eventually their body won't be able to make enough insulin to keep up and they will have impaired fasting glucose or prediabetes. This 2017 research study backs this claim up and says that using fasting glucose, oral glucose tolerance test or A1C may not be the most effective early screening tool for type two diabetes. Incorporating fasting insulin and especially insulin after an oral glucose tolerance test as enhanced screening methods may help to increase the ability to detect diabetes and prediabetes, allowing earlier intervention to prevent diabetic complications. Most prediabetics also struggle with weight gain or at least poor body composition. That means lower muscle mass and higher fat mass. That's because insulin is the primary hormone responsible for body weight. A rise in fat mass is a direct cause of insulin resistance because insulin is the hormone responsible for making this stuff. Then this fat releases a hormone called leptin. Over time, as your insulin goes up, your fat goes up and your leptin goes up. You become resistant not only to insulin, but also to leptin. Leptin works to counteract the effects of ghrelin or your hunger hormone. So the negative feedback loop that's supposed to keep you at a healthy weight becomes broken. Leptin stops inhibiting ghrelin and you sense hunger and eat, even though you have plenty of fat for fuel on your body. The best way to fix this and restore a healthy body fat and weight is to start at the source, lower insulin resistance. 
You've heard the phrase, when the tide comes in, all the boats rise. While well, in your body, insulin is the tide. When we focus on lowering insulin, all your other risk factor numbers improve. Triglycerides go down, blood pressure goes down, HDL cholesterol goes up, glucose goes down, body fat comes down, especially the unhealthy visceral belly fat that's inflammatory. So when we're looking at hidden symptoms of prediabetes, what we were actually focusing on are the hidden symptoms of insulin resistance and elevated blood sugars, because that is what's driving your diabetes. According to the Centers for Disease Control, or CDC, approximately 88 million American adults, more than one in three, have prediabetes. Of those with prediabetes, more than 84% don't know they have it. So it's safe to say the most common symptom of prediabetes would be no symptoms at all. At least none they recognize as being related to prediabetes, but they are. One symptom of prediabetes is weight gain, specifically a gain in fat mass. As I mentioned, your insulin is not only responsible for regulating blood sugars, but also your weight. Excessive hunger can also be a symptom of prediabetes, especially carb and sugar cravings. Cells that are resistant to insulin will sense a bit of starvation and increase your hunger, especially for foods that are known to give quick energy, the refined carbs. Excessive thirst can be a symptom of prediabetes. This increased fluid intake can also cause increased urination, which can be another symptom of prediabetes. Elevated blood pressure is a common symptom of prediabetes. High insulin directly causes high blood pressure. For some, high blood pressure may be the first sign of insulin resistance or prediabetes. They may just not have heard the link before. Dr. Bickman explains how insulin resistance causes high blood pressure in his book, Why We Get Sick. For those watching on YouTube, you can pause the video and check out this picture from Dr. Bickman's book that outlines five ways insulin resistance contributes to high blood pressure. If you haven't already, go buy that book. Fatigue is a common symptom of prediabetes. There are a lot of different potential causes for this fatigue, but a major one are the blood sugar spikes and dips that result from grazing on carbs. Your body is using a lot of energy just trying to balance your blood sugars. Other symptoms of high blood sugar are blurred vision or numbness and or tingling in your hands or your feet. This is called peripheral neuropathy and it can be very painful and limit activity. Frequent infections are another sign of prediabetes. High blood sugar impairs the white blood cell function critical to a healthy immune system. And sugar is a great source of energy for invading bacteria and fungi. These factors increase the risk of infections of all kinds and impair the immune system, so it takes longer to heal. Upper respiratory infections and urinary tract infections are two of the more common infections. If you notice you're getting them more often, consider that a warning sign to check your blood sugar and get them under control if you need to. In line with this impaired immune response would be slow healing wounds. That's why people with diabetes, especially those with peripheral neuropathy who may not be able to feel well, must be vigilant about visually inspecting their feet for cuts and catch and treat them early. Diabetic foot wounds can be very hard to heal and lead to amputations of toes or unfortunately, sometimes their foot or a part of their leg. The last symptom I wanted to cover here is brain fog or confusion. Your brain, is sensitive to insulin too. In fact, Alzheimer's disease is now being called type three diabetes. So for those of you who are motivated to keep your cognitive health as you age, I hope knowing there is a strong association between diabetes and dementia gives you strong, sustained motivation to prioritize your health, especially around menopause as estrogen drops, which causes insulin resistance to go up you're going to be at an increased risk of developing prediabetes or progressing into diabetes. So the years surrounding menopause are an especially critical time in a woman's life to get blood sugars under control. I don't say this to scare you. 
but this is the reality that I saw every single day in geriatric physical therapy. You can either make time for your health now or make time for being sick down the road. Those are your only two options. And if you do get sick, you'll be able to handle that so much better with a higher baseline of health. You're either moving toward better health or worse health with every decision you make. Very few people like to talk about what geriatric medicine actually looks like. And honestly, it can be very sad to see nice, kind people suffering from conditions that were largely preventable. That's why I'm so passionate about creating this content and helping you have a trusted source of information. Just to summarize, the major signs of prediabetes are impaired fasting glucose, which can be determined from a fasting blood glucose of 100 to 125, a blood glucose of 140 to 199, two hours after drinking 75 grams of glucose for the oral glucose tolerance test, a hemoglobin A1C of 5.7 to 6.4, or an exaggerated insulin response, even with a normal blood glucose response during the craft test. The symptoms of prediabetes were weight or fat mass gain, more hunger or thirst, increased urination, increased blood pressure, increased infections, reduced wound healing time, blurry vision, brain fog, fatigue, and peripheral neuropathy, which is numbness and or tingling in your hands and or feet that may or may not be painful. Now that you have a good understanding of the signs and symptoms of prediabetes and what can happen if you don't take action to lower your blood sugar, let's get into the best foods to lower blood sugar. In this part of the episode, I'll be starting with a review of macronutrients and micronutrients. Then I'll cover some zero sugar foods that will still raise blood sugar. And remember, the two hot tips at the end to control blood sugar after a high carb meal you don't wanna miss. I like to take a zoom out then zoom in approach. So we will start with the big picture and zoom in to learn more. By the end, you'll have five main takeaways to lower your blood sugar by optimizing your food choices. The big picture is that there are three main types of macronutrients. These are foods we, we eat in large quantities, such as carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Tracking your macros alone is not enough to get healthy. The types of macros you eat matter. Micronutrients, on the other hand, are nutrients we need in smaller amounts, such as vitamins and minerals. For those who are wondering, vitamins are organic substances, meaning they're made by plants or animals. Minerals are inorganic elements that come from the soil and water and are absorbed by plants or eaten by animals. Key takeaway number one is to stop counting points and calories. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to stop counting points or calories to get healthy. They are arbitrary numbers. There are no points or calorie receptors on your cells. There is, however, an insulin receptor in every cell. This brings me to key takeaway number two, start tracking your macronutrients. In order to understand the best foods to lower blood sugar, it's much more beneficial to learn how to track your macronutrients. When you're counting points or calories, you're actually disincentivized to eat foods that are high in calories, which happen to be some of the best foods to help lower blood sugar and lose weight. Carbohydrates, specifically starch and sugar, and proteins have four calories per gram, whereas fat has nine calories per gram. The problem arises when you look at this chart for how different macronutrients impact insulin and thus blood glucose. Fat actually has the lowest insulin response. Protein has a moderate, starches and sugars have the highest. Fiber actually slows the digestion of your food, meaning it slows the glucose and insulin response. So I love fiber and encourage my clients to find fiber sources their gut can tolerate well. You could eat a bowl of low fat oatmeal and think you're on the right track. When in reality, you'd be a lot better off with an omelet. Counting points or calories doesn't show you this, but tracking macros does. Here's a screenshot of two breakfast options and the difference between their macronutrient composition. 
The oatmeal and omelet are pretty similar in calories, but this bowl of oatmeal with a banana and some peanut butter has 64 grams of carbohydrates compared to the omelet's five grams. So you can bet that bowl of oatmeal will cause a high blood glucose and insulin response compared with the eggs. Extrapolating on that, you can safely say that all high starch and sugar foods will cause the highest blood glucose response. If you want to start tracking macros instead of points or calories, I have free how-to training videos using the Carb Manager app. You can go to www.zivly.com forward slash macros to download them today. That's www.zivly.com forward slash macros. This brings me to key takeaway number three, and that's to limit your intake of refined starches and sugars and replace them with lower carb options. That would include whole grain and multi-grain products too. If you love bread, pasta, rice, and sweets, I promise you there are healthier, low carb alternatives that still taste great. Now, is whole wheat healthier than white? Yes, but at that point, you're kind of cutting hairs. They are still both high in carbs. You're better off to reduce your portion size or replace it with a food that's higher in fiber, protein, or fat. What I've done in my diet is find substitutions that are either less processed or even better made with higher fat flours like coconut flour or almond flour. For example, instead of white pasta, we like the Bonza chickpea pasta. A side-by-side -side comparison of their macronutrient breakdown on the Carb Manager app shows you why. Two ounces of dry white pasta has 41 grams of net carbs, two grams of fiber, seven grams of protein, and one gram of fat. Two ounces of pasta made from chickpeas has 27 grams of net carbs, five grams of fiber, 13 grams of protein, and four grams of fat. When we have spaghetti, I'll do a big serving of the meat sauce and a smaller serving of chickpea noodles. Another example of a time where I don't find a substitution is when we make quick steak sandwiches. For these, I'll just scoop out my white roll as much as I can. That's an easy way to reduce your portion size of bread while still enjoying a bun. Little swaps like this can be really helpful for living a low insulin lifestyle that doesn't feel restrictive, like you have to give up all your favorite foods. I'll link to some videos below that I've done in the past on the best low carb swaps for white pasta, rice, and bread, along with some great lower carb fruits. The main point I want you to start doing is to look at the food label and check to see if it's high in net carbs and particularly if it's high in added sugar. If it is, find an alternative. Using the Carb Manager app or another macros tracking app can make this even easier to visualize. It's astonishing to me what big food companies can get away with for marketing. For example, one cup of these multi-grain Cheerios has 21 grams of net carbohydrates. The net carbs are the total carbs minus the fiber, because remember, fiber slows the blood sugar response. But six of those carbs are coming from added sugar, which as I covered in this video is the worst type of carb for your health because of the high amount of fructose it contains. It boggles my mind that they can put a red heart on here and say it may reduce the risk of heart disease. You know what reduces the risk of heart disease? Real food that doesn't need a food label. The salmon swimming around in the ocean or that avocado sitting on the shelf doesn't have a food label. If your food is coming out of a bag box or it has a barcode, it should cause you pause. Look at the ingredients and if you can't pronounce them, or don't visually see what the food is, like beans or nuts, then you can bet it's likely full of additives. Tracking macronutrients levels the playing field between different foods. You can ignore the packaging and actually see what you're eating in terms of macros. My members and clients are often shocked when they, when they see how many carbs they're actually eating. Once they start to bias their food intake, towards more protein and fat, they feel better and start seeing weight loss. Examples of high starch and sugar foods that will raise your blood sugar are cereals, bread, pasta, bagels, chips, and tortillas made with flours high in starch, such as wheat, rice, 
potato, oat, bran, sorghum, barley, millet, corn, and the like. I also consider foods with high sugar amounts like high sugar fruits, candy, donuts, cake, cookies, ice cream, brownies, pop, sweetened iced tea, many sports drinks or coffee drinks, and some of those healthy kombucha drinks to be unhealthy simply because of the amount of sugar. Again, there are healthy, delicious alternatives to all of these that won't have such a spike on your blood sugar. You really have to watch out for the sugar in your drinks. I'm gonna pick on one of my best friends, Michaela here, because her favorite Starbucks drink was a large white chocolate mocha. A 12 ounce tall has 40 grams of sugar, which is about as much as a can of Pepsi. Added sugar is also hiding in drink additives like coffee creamer. My favorite used to be the peppermint mocha creamer and I had about two cups a day with two tablespoons of creamer in each. There are five grams of added sugar in one tablespoon. So I was having 20 grams of added sugar in my coffee each morning. Crazy. Now you may be wondering if this sugar-free coffee creamer is any better. My answer is no, and that brings me to our fourth takeaway. Takeaway number four is to avoid sugar-free ingredients that still raise blood sugar. Now, while macronutrients are important, they don't tell the full story. A food may have zero carbs. Heck, it could have zero calories and still impact blood sugar. This is where it becomes important to screen packaged foods for a few key ingredients to avoid. Here are the main artificial sweeteners and texture additives to look out for on the ingredients list. Maltodextrin, sucralose, saccharin, aspartame, and acylfame potassium. If it has these, steer clear because chances are the sugar-free product will still raise your blood sugar. The first ingredient is maltodextrin. Maltodextrin is a white powder made from corn, rice, potato starch, or wheat. Even though it comes from plants, it's highly processed. I did a little research into maltodextrin and was a little grossed out by what I found. Maltodextrin is used as a thickener or filler to increase the volume of a processed food. It's also used as a thickener in personal care items, such as lotion and hair care products. So if eating lotion or hair care products sounds good to you, go ahead and eat that maltodextrin. It's also a preservative that increases the shelf life of packaged foods. It's inexpensive and easy to produce, so it's useful for thickening products such as instant pudding and gelatins, sauces, and salad dressings. Here are a few examples I found in my parents' pantry, even though I talked with them about this before. That's how I knew I needed to do a video on it. Sugar-free jello, sugar-free jam, Crystal Light, and many other similar pouches that you add to water. It can also be combined with artificial sweeteners to sweeten products such as canned fruits, desserts, and again, those powdered drinks. Maltodextrin has an even higher glycemic index than table sugar. This means that maltodextrin can cause a sharp increase or spike in your blood sugar shortly after you eat foods that contain it. The other sugar-free ingredients I want you to look out for are the artificial sweetener saccharin, also called sweet and low, sucralose, aka Splenda, aspartame, aka NutraSweet and Equal, and acylfame potassium, aka ACE-K and Sunnit. All of these have been found to raise blood sugar levels by dramatically changing the makeup of your gut bacteria. These are also known as post-oral metabolic effects. Unlike maltodextrin, they may not immediately impact your blood glucose, but over time they will contribute to insulin resistance and poor blood sugar control. If you're trying to reduce your sugar intake but still want a healthy sweetener, I recommend sticking to stevia, monk fruit, or erythritol. Stevia and monk fruit tend to be a little easier on the gut and cause less gas than erythritol. So instead of having this no sugar added hot cocoa that has maltodextrin, acylfame potassium, and sucralose, you could just make your own with some milk, cocoa powder, and stevia drops. That's what we do in our house and my kids love it. Again, it's these simple, easy, delicious swaps that will make your healthy lifestyle stick. 
Key number five is to choose your fats wisely. When it comes to lowering blood sugar, the good news is that great food actually can help you do this. Foods rich in healthy fat and protein are very satiating, meaning they help keep you full from one meal to the next. They are also nutrient dense, meaning unlike carbohydrates that usually just get stored as energy if you don't need the energy right away, fat and protein are put to use to make hormones, bones, muscles, and more. I've covered the different types of fats in depth in this video, but as a quick review, you're going to wanna to bias your fat intake towards whole unprocessed fats from animals and plants and avoid the processed fats. Let's break that down a bit. Great sources of fat from dairy would include whole milk, creamer half and half, string cheese, full fat Greek yogurt, cottage cheese, and butter or ghee. I've done a lot of research on saturated fats, and in my opinion, they're neutral at worst, beneficial at best. If you're worried about eating a lot of saturated fat because you're afraid of high cholesterol, I'm gonna push back on that because saturated fat is one of the few nutrients shown to raise HDL cholesterol, which is protective against heart disease. I'll link to a couple great interviews I've done with Dr. Nadira Lee and Nina Teicholz, who will hopefully put your mind at ease on this topic in the description below the, the video. Dr. Fung also does a great job putting the myth that saturated fat is linked to heart disease to bed. He sums it up by saying in his book, The Obesity Code, saturated fats raise HDL, the good cholesterol, and change LDL from small dense or bad to large LDL, which is mostly benign. Overall, saturated fats do not harm the blood lipid profiles like previously believed. Other healthy high fat foods that would keep insulin and sugars low are omega-3 fatty acids, specifically from fatty fish, because these are high in EPA and DHA that are anti-inflammatory. Plant sources of omega-3s like walnuts, chia seeds, and flax seeds are higher in ALA. There's a pretty low conversion rate, about eight to 15% from ALA to EPA and DHA. So if you're wanting the anti-inflammatory benefits of omega-3s, you'll need to get the EPA and DHA from fatty fish like tuna, trout, salmon, herring, mackerel, cod, and the like. If you don't wanna eat fish, you can get it from an algae oil, but be sure to run all supplements by your doctor just like any other medication. Omega-6 fatty acids are found in nuts and seeds and are also healthy, but omega-6 fatty acids found in the refined oils from those nuts and seeds are unhealthy. This is an important distinction. Whole food omega-6 is okay. Processed omega-6 is inflammatory. While they may not directly raise blood sugar or insulin, oils like canola, safflower, corn, soybean, and sunflower oil are not healthy to eat. The food products like ranch salad dressing, popcorn popped in this oil, chicken fingers and fries fried in vegetable oil are also not healthy. You're much better sticking to olive oil, coconut oil, avocado oil, butter, ghee, or lard for cooking. We primarily use olive and coconut oil and butter in our house and they work just fine. The last kind of healthy fat I focus on are omega-9 fatty acids or monounsaturated fats from whole foods like avocados, olives, nuts, and seeds. These are great for you and help keep blood sugar and insulin low. Along with the processed omega-6 fatty acid oils, the other unhealthy fat to avoid would be artificial trans fats and foods that contain them. Now there is some naturally occurring trans fats in animals and those are okay. What I want you to look out for are the words partially hydrogenated. Partially hydrogenated oils contain trans fats. In 2015, the Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, said that partially hydrogenated oil can no longer be generally recognized as safe, or GRAS. They said removing it from food could prevent thousands of heart attacks each year. And in 2018, the FDA went a step further and banned trans fats from new food products. Though the FDA's ban of trans fats went into effect in June of 2018, manufactured products before this date can still be distributed until it was about January 2020 or in some cases, 2021. 
Because of this ban on trans fats, food companies have had to re-engineer their products. I've noticed more fully hydrogenated oils on the ingredients list. This is still highly processed and unhealthy. Some food products may still have trans fats, such as margarine, vegetable shortening, microwave popcorn, fried fast foods, bakery products like muffins, cakes, pastries, and donuts, because they're often made with vegetable shortening or margarine, which are high in trans fats. Non-dairy coffee creamers, some canned frostings, crackers, chips, pies, and pizza, depending on their ingredients, may also have artificial trans fats. Again, you're going to have to read your food labels here. Partially hydrogenated oils are the primary source of trans fats. Food companies can still label their product trans fat free, even if they contain up to a half gram of trans fat per serving. With partially hydrogenated oils on the decline with the trans fat ban, palm oil and palm kernel oil are on the rise in food products. The palm oil and palm kernel oil are high in saturated fatty acids, about 50% and 80% 80, 80 respectively. The rest are unsaturated fats. I thought this graphic was helpful to see the ratio of saturated, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated fats found in oils. Polyunsaturated includes omega-3 and omega-6. And again, monounsaturated would be the omega-9. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see here the oils with a lot of blue have a high amount of those processed omega-6 oils that are inflammatory. The sunflower, safflower, grapeseed, wheat germ, walnut, soybean, corn, sesame, peanut, and canola oil. The healthier oils would be those higher in saturated fat and monounsaturated fat, including coconut, palm kernel, beef and chicken fat, almond, olive, and hazelnut. Avocado oil would be one high in monounsaturated fat too. It's just not in this picture. Even though there's this heart on the corn oil and it says cholesterol free, don't buy into their marketing. I have no idea why this heart is on there except that it probably boosts sales to people who don't know better. And now you do. One more thing to consider is the smoke points of different oils. Here's a helpful chart from Masterclass that reviews common oil smoke points. Smoking is a sign that your oil is breaking down. When oils break down, they can release chemicals that give food an undesirable burnt or bitter flavor, as well as free radicals that can harm the body by contributing to inflammation. Before using any oil, make sure its smoke point can handle the cooking method you plan to use. For example, I used to make homemade chicken nuggets in a butter slash dark olive oil combo, but now I just use butter to avoid the oxidized olive oil. When frying or cooking at high temperatures, consider using fats like clarified butter, light olive oil, or beef tallow. There are several oils on this list you could use to roast vegetables, just watch the temperature setting. So for example, I wouldn't wanna use extra virgin olive oil for roasting vegetables at 425 degrees because its smoke point is 325 to 375. I'd be oxidizing my healthy oil and making my healthy side dish a little bit less healthy. Again, easy switches here. Just swap your cooking fats. Now you know why I'm not crazy about this diabetes plate method because it's mostly carbohydrates and doesn't even talk about healthy fats. Key takeaway number six is to eat more protein. January's video was all about protein, so I'll link to that below and you can check that out. Key points are to aim for about 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight a day, and have at least 30 grams of high quality protein at each meal to reach about three grams of the amino acid leucine, so you can trigger more muscle growth. Great sources of protein would be cottage cheese, string cheese, beef, chicken, pork, fish and shellfish, soy products such as edamame or tempeh, and quality protein supplements from powders and bars that aren't full of a bunch of those unhealthy sugar-free ingredients I mentioned that can still raise blood sugar. Key takeaway number seven is to optimize your micronutrients. Harvard Health has a great table of vitamins and minerals, many of which are needed to optimally metabolize our food. 
This table also reports the recommended amount of each micronutrient we get each day. I'll link to it in the description below, but the ones I'll be focusing on for blood sugar regulation are magnesium, chromium, cysteine, calcium, vitamin D, and zinc. Let's start with the mineral magnesium. One study reported that 25 to 39% of people with diabetes also have a magnesium deficiency. Their summary was that low magnesium is seen in type 2 diabetes and there is an inverse correlation between the person's magnesium level and fasting and postprandial blood glucose levels. This means that those individuals with higher levels of magnesium had lower fasting glucose and better blood glucose responses after a meal. The study authors suggested that periodic monitoring of magnesium concentrations and magnesium supplementation can prevent chronic complications related to diabetes. Another study of 42 people with type 2 diabetes found that magnesium supplementation of 250 milligrams per day for three months helped reduce insulin resistance and improved blood sugar control. The next micronutrient to consider is chromium. I found this 2021 systematic review and meta-analysis on the effect of chromium on blood glucose. This review included a total of 10 randomized controlled trials involving 509 patients. Its results were a little less thrilling than what I was hoping for. The meta-analysis results showed that the differences between the experimental group and the control group in only one indicator of hemoglobin A1c were statistically significant, while there were no statistically significant differences in other indicators. The use of chromium supplements can reduce the A1c of type 2 diabetic patients to a certain extent, but it cannot effectively improve fasting blood glucose and blood lipid levels in type 2 diabetic patients. So you may get a slight benefit with a chromium supplement, but I would focus on magnesium first. Foods high in magnesium are leafy greens, pumpkin seeds, almonds, low sugar dark chocolate, some types of fish like salmon, mackerel, and halibut. The vitamin D family is also essential to ward off insulin resistance and improve your blood sugar regulation. Great natural sources of vitamin D include Hello Sunlight and fatty fish like tuna and salmon, egg yolks, cheese, and fortified milks. In Why We Get Sick, Dr. Bigman also identifies cysteine, calcium, or more specifically dairy, and zinc as important micronutrients to help with insulin resistance, which remember is at the core of prediabetes. So while you might not see a direct impact of these micronutrients on your blood sugar, you could be helping the root cause of your prediabetes. Other herbal supplements to consider would be adaptogens that can help you better adapt to and respond to stress, such as rhodiola, berberine, and cacao flavonoids. The book, The XX Brain by Dr. Lisa Moscone has helpful tables for different supplements to help for things like anxiety, depression, metabolism, and sleep. If you're looking for specific amounts to take per day, you can look to her book for reference. Be sure to always run a supplement by your doctor before taking them because they could interfere with the current medication. So one more time, the micronutrients and supplements you could consider to help lower your blood sugar are magnesium, chromium, vitamin D, cysteine, calcium, zinc, rhodiola, berberine, and cacao flavonoids. Hopefully, if that's something you're interested in, this episode can serve as a springboard of a conversation with your doctor, or you can go down your own research rabbit hole. Remember though, you can never out supplement an unhealthy lifestyle. Many lifestyle factors, not just what you eat, can impact your blood sugar. Food timing, sleep, stress, your environment or toxin exposure, and exercise are all areas you can optimize. It does take time and effort, but your health is worth it. Before I review those big takeaways again, here are the two hot tips I promise to better control your blood sugar 
especially after a high carb meal. Tip number one is to eat or drink fermented foods. Apple cider vinegar is my go-to. There are two great benefits of consuming fermented foods. The first is that when the bacteria ferment the food, they aren't eating through the protein and fat in the food. They're eating through the starches or sugars. So they are essentially doing some of the carb digestion for us. So the bacteria we consume by eating fermented food or liquid products means we're getting less starch than the non-fermented version. The other benefit is the beneficial bacteria can act as probiotics in our intestines. Now, several studies have shown that having one to two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar with a starchy meal helps lower the glucose and insulin effect of that meal in insulin resistant people and may help generally improve glucose control for people with type 2 diabetes. One study also found that taking two tablespoons of raw apple cider vinegar in the evening helps control glucose levels the following morning, lowering the normal dawn effect of elevated blood sugars from the morning rush of cortisol. A simple habit you could start is taking one to two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar in the morning and evening. You can dilute it with some water if you want to make the taste a little bit more palatable. The second hot tip is to move your body following a high carb meal. Going for a short walk after dinner can create muscle demand for glucose. The GLUT4 transporter is what allows your blood sugar to go from your bloodstream into your cells. And there are two primary stimulators of the GLUT4 transporter, muscle demand and insulin. Going for a walk, helps not only reduce your immediate blood sugar, but will help reduce the amount of insulin required to take care of the carbs you just ate. So because this was a longer episode, I wanted to take a moment and just summarize the seven key takeaways to help you optimize your diet to lower your blood sugar. Takeaway number one was to stop counting points and calories. Number two, start tracking macronutrients. It will put your food on level playing fields. Number three, swap unhealthy refined starches and sugars with healthier alternatives. Number four is to avoid sugar-free ingredients that still raise blood sugar, such as maltodextrin, sucralose, saccharin, acylphane potassium, and aspartame. Number five is to choose your fats wisely. Number six is to eat more high quality protein at each meal. And number seven is to optimize your micronutrients. The hot tips were to have one to two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar each morning and evening, or just start with one and go from there, and to move your body after a high carb meal. Unfortunately, your body won't get better by osmosis. You have to actually take action on what I'm sharing with you here. So within the next 48 hours, I want you to choose one thing to optimize from this video. Maybe you'll start using butter instead of canola oil, or swap your white pasta for chickpea or edamame pasta, or start scanning your ingredients to look for the sugar-free substances that still raise blood sugar. Go back to that question I challenged you with early in this episode. What is the easiest thing that I can change that would make the biggest impact on my health? What's the one thing you can act on within the next 48 hours? Leave a comment on YouTube and let me know. Pick the very easiest thing and go from there. Trying to change too many things at once can lead to overwhelm and burnout. Slow and steady wins the consistency race. If you liked this video, you're gonna love my program. So if you want help to lower your blood sugar, go to zivly.com. You can sign up for a free discovery call or join my program directly and get started today. If you haven't already subscribed to my YouTube channel, please take a moment and do that today, right now while you're watching. I'll be taking these longer episodes and cutting them up into shorter videos to make them easier to digest, pun intended, but those clips will only be on YouTube, not the podcast. So be sure to go on YouTube and subscribe in case you're listening to the podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in today and I'll see you again soon.